Go Live is on the air. We start with this. At 10 o'clock this morning, Browns wide receiver Josh Gordon tweeted out he'll miss the start of training camp due to part of his overall health and treatment plan. He does intend to rejoin the team soon. At 10.15, Cardinals running back David Johnson reports to camp. He did skip the team's mandatory minicamp in June, but opted to report. And at 10.40, Broncos linebacker Shane Ray avoids wrist surgery that would have sidelined him for part of training camp. He instead is rehabbing that wrist and will gradually be worked into camp. This news first reported by the NFL Network and confirmed by ESPN. Happy to have you with us on this Monday afternoon. I'm Wendy Nix, Diana Rossini, Tim Hasselbeck, and Lewis Riddick. Josh Gordon has not played a full season for the Browns since his rookie year in 2012. And today he says he won't be there at the start of training camp. Veterans for Cleveland report on Wednesday. He said in a statement posted on social media, the absence is due in part as part of his overall health and treatment plan. Here is the full statement from Gordon addressed to the Browns and his NFL family. I am reaching out to you all personally and letting you know that I am not only doing great physically, but mentally as well. You will notice that I will not be in Cleveland for the start of training camp. Rest assured, this too is a part of my overall health and treatment plan. I appreciate the awesome support I've received from teammates, friends, fans, and the Browns organization. Just like you, I'm excited to start the season and have every intention of being ready and available to join my teammates soon to help bring winning football to our fans. With the help of the NFL, NFLPA, and the Browns, I have been able to utilize the resources available to me that will ensure my well-being on and off the field. By continuing to follow the plan set up by our medical director and his team and taking this time before the season starts, we believe it will help me maintain the progress I've made for not only today, but for many years to come. Thank you all for your patience, love, and support. Go Browns. This from Brown CM John Dorsey about Josh Gordon. We will continue to support Josh as he receives the care needed to maintain his progress. We're going to respect his privacy while he is away from the team. Josh will be placed on the non-football illness reserve list until he is ready to return. Our Adam Schefter has been working this story as well and reports that there have been no setbacks or other Issues. Browns wide receiver Josh Gordon did not have any slip-ups or failed tests. According to sources, his leave is a proactive defensive gesture to get extra counseling to try to ensure he does not have any of the setbacks that have marked his past. Those who know him say he has worked his off. Lewis, you hope, and it would appear to be, uh, a step in the right direction for Josh Gordon to continue to stay healthy and ultimately contribute when he's back on the field. No question about it, Wendy. I think this is a tremendous show of self-awareness, uh, maybe a sign of maturity, a sign of, of Josh understanding, hey, look, these are the things that I struggle with. These are the things that will set me up for success. And this is bigger than just me being back out on the football field and being a part of this football team at the beginning of training camp. We all know that Josh is a transcendent talent as far as being on the football field. He'll be able to catch up quickly from a football perspective. He's trying to catch up as far as his life skills and as far as setting himself up far beyond his days of playing on the football field. And I commend him for taking this step and saying, hey, look, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to face everything that is going to be thrown at me, all the temptations that's going to be thrown at me, all the different experiences that are going to be thrown at me right now. So I'm going to take my time here. And again, this is bigger than just football, Tim. And it's I I like the the self-awareness that he is showing right now because many guys, I'm sure, wouldn't take this step. They wouldn't want to show because they would perceive it as being weak, right? And they would, they would know that there's going to be some people out there who are going to be skeptical going, I don't buy it. Don't buy it for one minute. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, which is unfair. So let's just take him for his word and wish him the very best. Yeah, I, I was struck by the tone of optimism in his statement, to be honest with you. And then when I mean, you, you know, I guess combine that with Adam's report about how hard he's worked to kind of to get back in his patience Mm -hmm. with the process as well. Look, none of us up here know what he has been through or is going through. We know he's a heck of a football player, but we don't know the other side of it. And I think the fact that, 
you know, he's able to be patient enough in the process and know that it isn't just about, oh, hey, be ready right now for the start of training camp. So many times it's easy for players to be kind of prisoners of the moment and race back from an injury or feel like, you know, that week's practice is the most important week. And the reality is there's a much bigger picture, especially for someone like Josh. So, look, I, I hope that this is just a continuation of a process that gets him back out on the football field and kind of a healthy, productive life. I think it was natural for all of us, though, when we first saw the story, to be a, a, a bit skeptical because of his past. He's only played in 10 games since 2014. And, and my first thought was, I think he may have gotten in trouble again. But as we are finding out now and we're getting more, more sourced reports here, it, this is something that is self-aware. And Lewis really put it best. It's showing maturity. And, you know, speaking to players and his teammates about what he's been doing off the field in terms of the football. And, you know, you saw that quote with he's been working his, his tail off. Uh, I, I did kind of laugh when I first saw that because that's what I've been hearing too. It's like the same exact phrase everyone's been using because he's been so impressive with his work ethic and trying to get back on the field, be healthy and, do, and making the right decisions. And it seems that he's making the right decision for himself. Right I now. hope so. It's a long road. And I will say this, anybody who doesn't wish for someone to find their way into recovery and to maintain that, you know what? Shame on you. So I hope it continues. The talent is certainly there. In 2013, Gordon led the league in receiving. He remains the only player in NFL history to record back-to-back games with 200 receiving yards. Meanwhile, how is this for a sight for sore eyes, especially for Indianapolis Colts fans? Andrew Luck, along with that surgically repaired shoulder, have been cleared to participate. They've also reported to training camp. GM Chris Ballard said Friday, Luck will take starting quarterback reps when the team holds its first practice on Thursday. It is Monday. It is the week the teams report to camp. So, of course, it is a perfect time for overreaction Monday. And I'll start with this. Andrew Luck will start all 16 games this season. Tim, is that an overreaction or not so much? I'm saying it's not an overreaction. He's throwing a football that's the size of NFL football, so we'll start there. But in all seriousness, he, he, the way they're making it sound is that he's full systems go. He's going to have some planned off days for rest. That's not unusual for quarterbacks. And so, you know, I, I don't think for Andrew it's really been about the physical condition that he's in other than can he throw? Can he throw properly? And it appears that he can. And so I think because of that, he's the starter for 16 games. I'm going to say it's an overreaction only because there's so much unknown. And that's not because I'm trying to be pessimistic about it. I'm Look, I am hopeful that he does play all 16 games. The Colts need him to play all 16 games. The NFL needs him to play all 16 games. It's just that there's so many unknown factors, right? I mean, even if he starts week one, we don't know how he will recover if he had to throw yeah. the ball 50 times in a game and gets dumped on that throwing shoulder a few times by a 250-pound pass rusher. We don't know what the residual soreness will how it will manifest itself. What does that mean? Like come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I can't throw at all because yeah. I'm so sore. You know, and you don't look, I don't want any of that to happen, but I think because it's overreaction Monday, <laughs> I mean, it's an overreaction. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. And because you don't have a tie today I, and you're relaxed. Uh, Y'all, that's uh, what it is. Well, then you should be more you're, positive. You're, you're settled down. <laughs> The ties help me loosen up. Oh, they do. Oh. I mean, I'm saying the lack of tie helps me loosen up. So I mean, look I'm going to be I'm going to be Johnny. I'm going to be Johnny optimistic today. Okay, okay. I like okay. it. The rest of the way, All right. Diana. Well, I, I'm in loose corner, even though I'm relaxed and happy on this Monday. I, I am. This is an overreaction to me. I just don't think we know enough. I think his history has shown that he's had trouble getting back on the field. But I really have three other issues with it. Yes, his health is going to be an issue. His offensive line, I think, could be an issue in keeping him up on his feet. And, guys, what was the narrative before he was seriously injured? He was taking those unnecessary hits. Has he been able to improve that? Has he been able to fix that? I think that's going to play a factor into whether or not he can go all 16 games healthy. But in terms of just the fact that he's throwing a football and he's going to be starting training camp when we know he's missed all this time, it's nothing but positive. But I'm still skeptical. I'm going over action. At least it's a step in the right direction. We've been waiting mm-hmm. a long time to get mm-hmm. to this point. So, again, hope it continues. Other camp-related news. Arizona Cardinals running back David Johnson is saying no more to a contract holdout that ran through the team's mandatory minicamp. He will be at the start of training camp. He told ArizonaCardinals.com the contract talks with the team are progressing, saying the Cardinals want to pay me, want me to play for them for a long time, and I want to be here for a long time. Despite missing 15 games last season with that wrist injury. Johnson's 32 touchdowns from scrimmage over the last three seasons ranked third in the NFL behind 
Devontae Freeman and Todd Gurley. He put together a 20-touchdown uh, 2016 campaign with over 2,000 scrimmage yards, both of which led the NFL. And then there's this. ESPN.com surveyed league, ex- league executives as well regarding which rookie quarterback is most likely to start right away. Josh Allen leading the pack. Next up, Cardinals 10th overall pick, Josh Rosen. He'll compete for the starting gig with Sam Bradford, as we know, has dealt with his fair share of injuries over the years. Jets top pick, Sam Darnold, will battle in a three-way competition with veteran Josh McCown, who played well at times last year, and Teddy Bridgewater, who signed a one-year deal in the offseason. We don't know when Brown's number one pick, Baker Mayfield, will see the field. Tyrod Taylor's looks to be the starter for now. Taylor has the third best touchdown to interception ratio in the league since 2015. And Ravens quarterback Lamar Jackson likely will sit behind veteran Joe Flacco and learn the ropes, not to mention Flacco carrying a whopping $24.8 million cap hit in 2018. For reference, let's take a look at recent history of the 27 quarterbacks taken first round in the previous 10 drafts. Over half started week one as rookies. And get this, 26 of the 27 started at some point their rookie year. The only quarterback in that time that didn't start as a rookie, Jake Locker, who sat behind... Matt Hasselbeck. Matt Hasselbeck. From 1998 to 2007, only four of the 28 rookie first-round quarterbacks started week one. Eight never logged a start in their first year. So here we are as we get set for 2018. So much of the lead up to the draft was about rookie quarterbacks. And now we'll look uh, as we play a little with draw play, if draw you play. will. Like draw that. play. Uh, the number of games we think each of these quarterbacks will start in their rookie season. And we'll start with Josh Allen. Tim, uh, your number, please. For Josh Allen, I'm actually going nine. Not a real good nine, but I'm going nine mainly because – I don't think that they necessarily have what they're looking for at the position outside of him, which is why they drafted him. And listen, A.J. McCarron, maybe he starts the season, but I think Josh Allen starts over half of their games this year. He's a big, strong kid. Um, I think some of the things we'll be able to do with how he can attack the field because he has such a big arm will be enticing to them. And I think ultimately Josh Allen, they want to be the guy, and I think learning by being out there will be the key. Obviously, they made a decision that Tyrod Taylor wasn't the guy mm-hmm. and made that move. Good call, Tim. Good call. All right. You like that? Uh, I like no, Josh Rosen, no. my really friend. Like it, but, I'm with you. Know, you. I like you, Tim, so. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, wow. Ooh, third. it's a big I'm going to say 13. Look, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me explain my reasoning here, okay? One, three of the first four Cardinals games are at home. All right? So let's just say... You know, Sam Bradford should get off to a fast start. They're playing three or four at home. But before they go on a two-game stretch there in weeks five and six, they have a home game. So I'm saying this. I'm saying Sam Bradford, something happens. Either he's a little gimpy, doesn't play up to snuff, and then they can get Josh Rosen a start in one of those in that fourth game that's going to be at home, and then he's going to go on the road against San Francisco. Look, I think the kid... Look, I mean, we're just trying. I'm just trying to justify why I think he's going to play 13. Quite honestly, why I think he's going to play 13 because I think he's better than Sam Bradford, and I don't think Sam Bradford's going to last. And I think what? he's the best quarterback so me, in this let draft. Let me ask you this: Simple as that. Is this more a vote of confidence for Josh Rosen and his ability as a rookie, or is this a lack of confidence in Sam Bradford's ability to stay healthy? It's a little bit of both, but I, it's more so because I really do believe that this kid is the prototypical quarterback in the NFL in terms of a pocket passer type and I think he's going to play at a very very high level and I think Mike McCoy and him are going to gel I think look there's too much news coming out of there right now that isn't just hyperbole Tim it's like it's for real they're saying that the kid is showing tremendous maturity and tremendous efficiency maybe all this changes once the preseason games start but I doubt it he's going to be playing against two or three coverages all Mm -hmm. preseason long he should probably rip it up I think he's just going to start sooner than later. And you're right. The the, the word from really the early days has been nothing but positive when I'm it really comes to this I'm really trying to beat you on this because I'm like fuming. I think this is absurd in, in thinking. Whoa. Yeah, Whoa. I mean, she Whoa. she Whoa. has said Whoa. fuming. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead. Well, my argument is, for, well, for, I'm just going to go based on, on, on information I can gather about Sam Bradford in terms of when he's healthy. Players tell me he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league, top five best quarterbacks in the league when he is healthy. Sam so you're Bradford. telling me, yes. So you're telling me Josh Rosen is going to be able to step in there as a rookie and beat Sam Brad, a healthy Sam Bradford? Just, There's no oh, way. He's, he's, Sam Bradford's a top five quarterback in the league when he's healthy and what he has perfect protection and every wide receiver is open and they have the perfect play call. Sam, 
I'm not a believer like that. And I'll tell you this, if I was in the league and I was playing right now, I'd like to play against Sam Bradford, quite honestly. I really would. Now, that's, I'm not trying to take away from his ability, Diane, and I'm not trying to be you know, contentious here. I'm just saying this. I do think primarily, look, Sam's play always comes in spurts, right? Because he's just not able to stay on the football field, whether it's a catastrophic injury or because he's just not at full health. I think the future is him. I really do, and I just think it's going to come sooner rather than later. I'm not wishing for Sam to get hurt. I just think it's going to come sooner rather than later. So I think it's a very likely scenario that let's say Sam plays great while he's healthy in camp. And think about it. He started week one for the Vikings last year. Sure. Yeah. But then he couldn't keep playing. I right. mean, that's just it's ultimately how it worked out. It, it, and then how it's worked out really the entirety of his career so far. Having said that, let's move now to the New York Jets. They, too, have a rookie quarterback on the roster. Okay, you know what? Roster. I want to hear your, your so, argument because I'm coming for it. I, I just want you to know. Four. I just want okay, you to know. Okay, so we know Sam Darnold. So we know they got Josh McCown there. They got mm-hmm. Teddy Bridgewater there. Mm-hmm. But I think New York has zero patience when it comes to Sam Darnold because of the excitement that they have to see him play. And everything I hear about what he's been able to do and how he understands the game, I think what, goes, what happens, they go out there, they lose to the Lions, they lose to the Dolphins, and week three they have – the Browns. What better team to face than the Cleveland Browns to give a rookie quarterback an opportunity to go out there? So putting that together, saying so, we got what, 13, 14, we'll say. Right. Wow. 14. I'm going, You're going go big or go home. Wow. Team, here's another reason why I think. Josh McCown, I hope your DVR is working. Josh mm. McCown, I am sorry. You're a great dude. I'm a firm <laughs> believer that, that you're the best quarterback at this point. But I think by week three, the impatience is going to get to the head coach, to the owner. But also right across town, the New York Giants have a guy named Saquon Barkley. That's going to be snagging all the headlines. And the New York Jets are going to want a little piece of it. And so they're going to say, you know what? We've got a tool in our shed, too. We're going to play him. Sam Darnold, you're in. Ooh, good luck. The Jets aren't losing to the Lions and the Dolphins to start the season. If they do, there's going to be a whole lot of other things going on, too. (laughs) Okay, there may be all kinds of people uh, trying to do some changes there. I think the interesting thing there is Josh McCown, much like Sam Bradford, staying healthy ends up being the key. Mm. I think 14 seems a lot for me for, for Sam Darnold, but... But I think he's going to start at some point. All right, let's let's uh, let's let's go to the top, the top of the food chain, at least in terms of the draft, shall we? Baker Mayfield and the Cleveland Browns, Timothy. Twelve. I think it starts twelve that seems games. About right. I think Tyrod Taylor probably starts the season, and I think the excitement around Baker Mayfield is just going to be too much. They're they're just they're almost super fans of him inside the organization, right? They are so excited, love his competitiveness. And I, listen, I might be underestimating this here. I, if he starts the season, it just ultimately ends up about being healthy, and he can end up starting all 16 for him. I, I think, I think Baker Mayfield. There's a good shot he starts at least 16, but I think he starts at least 12. I'll say this: it's the year of the rookie quarterback. If any of the, if, if these predictions are anywhere it's near a time, correct, a lot, a lot of, you, lot of playing time for rookie though, quarterback. Think zero, though, right? You've heard that they're but thinking. Listen, Right, right. How but many times have we seen that Wentz movie? wasn't supposed yeah. to play. And, oh, no, no, you know, I'm with you on you that, know. but this is the plan is to stick with Tyrod. All right, Lamar Jackson. Yeah, and this is, a, I mean. Oh, this is the good, this is really good. And yeah. this is starts now. This is not yeah, package plays. Is this, is, this is starts. You know what? I mean, look, this is ideally what I think it's going to be. All right? Man. Finally. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Only because I think there's so many pieces in place for this football team. We talked about it the last time we were here on NFL Live, Tim. I think there's a lot of pieces in place for the Ravens to really be a wild card contender. Do I think they've added enough maybe to challenge the Pittsburgh Steelers? Look, you know how the seasons can go. You know how chemistry goes. It's not something you can really measure. And maybe they hit on something this offseason and the Steelers take a hit somewhere this offseason as far as their chemistry. But I like how this football team is built. I like the weapons they got for Joe Flacco. I think Joe Flacco, every player likes to be challenged. No matter how much money you've made, no matter how many Super Bowls you've won, when they draft the quarterback first overall, if it doesn't light a fire, then you're probably on your way out of there anyway sooner rather than later. I think the plan would be for him to sit I think Joe still has a lot left. He has no more excuses this year. Mm-hmm. It's the first time in camp he's healthy. We saw last yeah. year he was dealing with the back injury. Year before that, he has knee injury. And all they're saying down in Baltimore right now is he looks superb. Mm-hmm. He's mobile. He's accurate. This is the best Joe Flacco we've seen in years, all according to the Ravens coaching yeah. staff. Well, speaking of that, then take a look at this from our Ravens reporter, Jamison Hensley. This is about... Lamar Jackson. One of the highlights of Monday's practice was Lamar Jackson spinning and cutting to avoid about six defenders. Yes, there's no hitting the quarterback, but Jackson's elusiveness is extremely impressive. Mm -hmm. Ow, ow. 
Yep, you guessed it. I'm a speed bum. So I've got one job. I slow you down. So imagine how I feel about Geico, who does way more. Like, not only could they save you money on car insurance, but they've been around for over 75 years, giving people fast and friendly claim service. Ow, ow. Plus, they got a nifty mobile app that gives you 24-7 access. Ow, ow. Just doing my job, buddy. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. It's been 16 years since John Gruden wore silver and black, but he is back. And on Friday, Gruden hosted a raucous rally for more than 600 Raider fans held at a local sports bar. He even went so far as to foot the bill. He spoke with our Paul Gutierrez at the event. I'm back as a coach. I've been gone for a long time. This was more fun than I ever had when I was here the last time. And I felt it was important to come out here and reunite with the Raider fans, get in the right frame of mind before training camp starts. And coming off that stage, what did you feel from the fans out there? I just feel the, the passion that they have for the silver and black. It's one of the reasons I came back. I love the city of Oakland. I love the Oakland Raiders, and I particularly love the fans. And they're different. Yeah. You, you saw that today. They're a lot different. I'm proud of them. You told the fans out there, you're going to figure out a way to get Khalil Mack back. Any, anything new on that front? Uh, that might be the toughest <laughs> Uh, decision I have to figure out right now, but uh, we're not the only team that's faced with that. It's it's tough. It's part of this business, and we'll just keep our fingers crossed. Fingers are crossed as we continue with overreaction Monday. Khalil Mack is the most important player to the Raiders' success. Diana? Uh, I'm going to go that's an overreaction, and I know every coach out there watching is going to say, well, my answer is because Derek Carr is the most important player on this team and I know it's difficult to compare a quarterback and a defensive player because we know the the, the completely different positions obviously and they have different uh, power over their team but this team moves the way Derek Carr moves he saw two years ago before he was injured during uh, right before the playoffs there when he's playing well this team is victorious Last year we saw when they stepped into some holes it usually had something to do with Derek Carr's performance so while Khalil Mack He's obviously the 2016 Defensive Player of the Year. He's extremely talented. He's skilled. We know what he is. The success of the Raiders this season falls on the shoulders of Derek Carr. All right. Overreaction or not? I agree agree with Diana here. I mean, the reality is is you can have an awesome defensive player. We saw it with J.J. Watt, you know, where he was the most dominant defensive player in the league. And they were a two-win team, you know, the Houston Texans were. And so I think that as good as Khalil Mack is – Teams don't have bad seasons when their quarterbacks are having good seasons. You can have a bad season if a pass rusher has 15 sacks and the offense can't get it together. So it's an overreaction for me, but there's no question he's super important for that organization. Yeah, I agree. It's an overreaction. Look, outside of Philadelphia, I mean, how many teams could say that their quarterback isn't their their starting quarterback or their presumed starting yeah. quarterback is the most important guy on the team? And until Nick Foles played the way he did, you would have thought Carson Wentz, look, you couldn't live without him. Can the Raiders win with Connor Cook? Can the Raiders win with E.J. Manuel? No. Not, not, or a reaction? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. The, the, I, I enough said. Enough no, said. They Just, can't. Come on. All right. But again, again, it's a happy Monday. We, we, we already yeah. talked hey, about I'm smiling. I'm smiling. I'm smiling. I'm smiling. I'm just telling you to do that. You're going to smile at this. Trust me. Watch John Gruden with some local kids. This is a reaction drill. Listen up, man. You got to be able to think and react quick. Are you guys with me? Yes. All right. You got to do exactly what I do. Everybody ready? Yes. I said do it quicker. It's not quick enough. React. It's not quick enough. You better speed it up. <laughs> I love it. Like you got to speed it up. It's like John Gruden, Simon Says, right there. there you go. His own version of it. And just watching that video just kind of reminds me again of why John Gruden joining the Raiders is, is such a positive thing for Derek Carr, not just because of what he can bring and, and teach and, and mentor and help and coach Derek Carr, but the pressure, the eyes. 
are going to now be off Derek Carr and on John Gruden because he mm. takes a lot of that limelight because of his bodacious personality and what he brings to the field. So I think this is why it's going to help for De- help Derek Carr be successful this season. Anybody got kids that age knows their energy is off the charts. I mean, you want to cry by like 9 a.m. I think John Gruden has that same amount of energy. <laughs> and I don't think you could say that very I often. I could use a little help with some, some 10-year-olds if he's available. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no kidding, right? <laughs> uh, there are high hopes, obviously, for Raider Nation because, as we've talked about, quarterback Derek Carr. Our Monday night football crew led by Joe Tessitore breaks down the AFC. You know, for the last decade and a half, most of these summer prediction kind of conversations in the AFC have just been a rinse and repeat conversation (laughs) dealing with the New England Patriots. Of course, coming off the Super Bowl loss and with enough roster changes to make you at least give pause and Mm -hmm. think about what they're going to look like this year. Fifth time they're coming off a Super Bowl loss. They've never gone back to the Super Bowl as AFC champions following a Super Bowl loss. Are they still the team to beat in the AFC? Let me give pause. Yes, <laughs> yes, they are still the team to beat because of the division they're in and because of Brady and Belichick are still together. Now, if we set them to the side, for me, the team I'm going to pick is the Jacksonville Jaguars. You love that defense. I love the Jaguars' defense. Two lockdown corners, a defensive line that may be the highest paid defensive line in football, and I think an offense that understands their identity. I saw Leonard Fournette. He slimmed down. He's in better shape, and I think he'll be a better running back. And Blake Bortles just has to be, just be Blake, be you, and don't turn the game over. Yeah, I don't even need a pause. Of course it starts with New England. With number 12 on the sidelines and Belichick in the hoodie, yeah. they're always the favorite. But I like Houston. I mm, like Deshaun Watson, what he did down there. Billy O'Brien's a great coach. He's excited. He's rejuvenated yeah. with Deshaun. And a great defense, Romeo Cornell leading that charge with J.J. Watt and company. So don't be surprised. And they're in a poor division. I don't yeah. think the ASC South is a tough division. But it starts and ends with the New England Patriots. Here's the key for Houston, though. Can Houston stay healthy? If right. they can stay healthy, well, Deshaun, Merciless, with the leg, Watt, yep. Watson, they'll be fine if they can stay healthy. What about Pittsburgh and all the offensive talent? It's a lot of offensive talent. We've seen that before. But they gave up 45 to Jacksonville in the playoff game. Yep. Can they stop anybody defensively? We know what Ben Roth- Roethlisberger, Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell may be the best running back in the league. But I've been surprised. Mike Tomlin, a defensive coach, their defense has been underrated and undervalued the last couple years. They just can't pull it together on defense. It's a toughness. It's a yep. mindset. They've done it yep. for a lot of times. Don't forget, though, they lost defensive coordinator a long time, Dick LeBeau, mm. Mm. and this guy, and they're missing mm. him. But Ben Roethlisberger, these guys, Antonio Brown is most, one of the dynamic yes. uh, receivers in the National Football League. So Pittsburgh's always going to be in the hunt because of the mindset they have in Pittsburgh. I like this, a Jacksonville endorsement and a watch out for the X Factor of Houston. When it comes to the Patriots, <laughs> folks, remember, you got to go back to 1993 in the Buffalo Bills to find a team that lost the Super Bowl and then the next year went back to the Super Bowl. Mm. Well, Joe Tess, if we're talking threats to the Patriots, tight end Rob Gronkowski swam with the Sharks. This is part of Discovery Channel's Shark Week, which began on Sunday. His undersea encounter got us thinking about the best shark defenders in the mm-hmm. AFC. Find out why sharks are so good at catching their prey. Some sharks can grow up, Lewis, to an average of 20 feet in length. Okay. They've got incredible eyesight. Yeah. Unlike me, they can see more <laughs> colors than humans. And they can also detect light and darkness. And they have impressive bursts of speed, also unlike me. Some sharks can attain speeds of 25 to 30 miles per hour and don't even talk Unlike about you again uh, that's what i yep it, oh, okay. it keeps no, going yep, yep. i don't know about this one great whites have a bite force at two tons that is 20 times greater than the bite force of a human basically i am out of luck when it comes to comparing the sharks uh let's listen though in all seriousness we, we want to talk about the defensive sharks if you will in the afc and explain what we mean by that and then give us your top three yeah really i mean look the, some of the attributes that you talked about right there you just want to see those kind of attributes manifest themselves on the football field in terms of how they play how fast they play how instinctive they play and then at the point of attack do they hit well these are the guys who i think embody all those attributes starting with jalen ramsey from the jacksonville jaguars look when you talk about a guy who has tremendous size for his position He's the prototype, man. He has got it all in terms of his wingspan, his height, his reach, his speed. Now here, when you're talking about eyesight, that's tremendous hand-eye coordination, burst of speed, and ability to finish football plays right there. We didn't see any plays of him hitting right there as far as bite force. But let me tell you something. When Jalen Ramsey hits you, look, you go down. It's just that simple. All right, number two. Yeah, Joey Bosa would be next because, again, when you're looking at a guy who's just a prototype as far as 4-3 defensive ends or 3-4 defensive ends or 3-4 outside linebackers, he has it all here. 
you know, you were talking about explosiveness at the point of attack, hand-eye coordination there. You saw, you saw speed, you saw strength, you saw instinctiveness to go ahead and go for the swat right there and have the quarterback strip sack. Those are the kind of things that you're looking for. Again, explosive playmakers. And then number one, this is the guy who embodies it, I think, better than anybody. The top defensive shark of the AFC. Absolutely. In the AFC, Von uh... Miller. Look, if the game is on the line, this is the kind of shark I want swimming in the waters for me. Because he can finish. Speed, power, instincts, eyesight. And the guy, when he hits again, look, you're seeing him here get the strip sacks, but Von Miller will lay it on you too as far as explosive hits. Look, these guys are just one-of-a-kind type of players, Wendy. In the name of Shark Week, that's my list. In the name of Shark Week. Would you want to swim with a shark, Wade Gronk? Would you do it? Uh, No. No, you don't? No interest? You know what? I, I would know. if I could. You could just guarantee me that that you know. Well, yeah, therein lies the rub, right? Yeah. I want. You know what? I would want to see. I want to see a hammerhead up close. Okay. Those things are fascinating. I'm sure we to can me. figure this out. Yeah, we'll work you on just, it. You throw me in there, wouldn't you? <laughs> Clemson products well represented in the NFL. Texans wide out DeAndre Hopkins had a huge 2017 campaign, a league-high 13 touchdown catches. Before a season-ending torn ACL, Hopkins teammate Deshaun Watson led the league with 21 offensive touchdowns and 81 QBR in the first eight weeks. Chiefs wide out Sammy Watkins has averaged the fourth most yards per reception in the NFL since 2014 among guys with 100 catches and in 2016 Falcons linebacker Vic Beasley led the league an impressive 15 and a half sacks and with that we say hello to Clemson head coach Dabo Sweeney he's pulling double duty here uh, leaving the college game for just a few minutes to talk NFL football uh, with us let's start with your former quarterback uh, coach because you you certainly got some attention when you talked about Deshaun Watson's future comparing him to Michael Jordan, which at the time people said, hey, talk about hyperbole, all of that. And you said, if they pass on Deshaun Watson, I'm telling you, they're passing on Michael Jordan. I tell you what, people have a different opinion of that statement today than they did when you made it. What have you seen from Deshaun Watson? Exactly what I saw at Clemson. You know, just a young man that's uh, incredibly confident because of his preparation. Uh, He's a relentless competitor. He makes everyone else around him better. He makes everyone around him believe. And uh, he just has this poise that you can't coach and and a demeanor that uh, uh, is special. So uh, incredible skill set. You know, obviously he can make all the throws, but I think last year his ability to show how he could extend plays uh, was, uh, you know, a part of the game we've seen. I'm not. I'm not sure a lot of people knew how that would translate to the next level, but he did pretty good with it. He did, I think. Yes, pretty good is an understatement. I, he is coming off a second torn ACL, though, which of course was bad timing. Yep. You were there for the first one, so you first seen him in that recovery <clears throat> process. What do you expect from him this time around, having to do it again? I think he'll be even be better than he was the first time, just simply because he had the experience to draw upon. Uh, with us, he had surgery the first week of December, and uh, and so it was back in August and and played in two straight national championship games, 30 straight games, didn't miss a beat, uh, and just got better and better. And I think it's going to be the same thing. Not that he's going to be in Super Bowls and all that consecutively, but I think his experience that he was able to draw upon that first uh, uh, injury and then the fact that it happened earlier, I guess it was in maybe October or something like that, uh, plus the fact that he was able to go play and prove what he could do, I think – you know, and the second time through the NFL calendar, you know, the OTAs, the schedule of it, the pr- preparation part, he'll be much more mentally and physically prepared for this season. Players talk about that often, how the learning curve shrinks sure. in that second season because it's so dramatic the first time around. And I'll ask you about that because, you know, now rookie quarterbacks honestly are expected to come in and a lot of times contribute immediately to be successful in the NFL almost in a heartbeat. You know, what is that? What are the challenges there, Coach? And is it more difficult now for these quarterbacks because of those early expectations? Well, I think it's always difficult for quarterbacks, but but certainly one that's going to be just going to play early, uh, especially if they're not quite prepared, you know. And I think that's the worst thing you can do is put a guy out there that's not ready. Uh, But in the NFL, you know, you're going to see, you know, an incredible uh, amount of different looks and exotics and things like that. You're dealing with the best of the best from a personnel standpoint. Obviously, it's all ball all day, great coaches, great schemes. So a lot's going to be thrown at you, especially as a, as a rookie. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to test you. And, uh, but you know, what, what people didn't know about Deshaun coming in, and that was kind of my, 
comments early on him, and I didn't really know how to articulate the things that people don't see on tape, and that is how smart he is, his football IQ, how how quick he absorbs things. So I knew that that it was just a matter of time uh, because you don't know till you start coaching a guy. And uh, but his understanding of protections, uh, his ability to see the whole field, his poise, his leadership. Uh, and his arm, uh, his accuracy, those are all things that I knew would translate well to the next level. Well, I tell you what, and with Watson coming back hopefully healthy, the expectations now for the Texans are sky high because of their quarterback. But let's look at some of these other guys who have come through Clemson, who've played for you, and get a scouting report, if you will, right. uh, on their NFL, uh, their time in the NFL. And we'll, we'll t- start with Sammy Watkins. He's a superstar just waiting to happen. Uh, you know, the guy is, uh, has, has been very productive uh, when he's – uh, been healthy and, and so forth, but it's just if he stays healthy, he's going to be unbelievable. He is a uh, great football player, uh, explosive, and uh, like I said, has done a lot of good things. And that's good to see him uh, settle in uh, at Kansas City, and I think uh, he's in for a bright future. Well, and you're right, he has done some great things. Needs to be a little bit more consistent to yeah. what you're alluding to. How about uh, DeAndre Hopkins? Well, he's a, he's a true superstar, you know. I mean, this is a guy that has proven that uh, he's as good as there is. Um, and, uh, you know, it's so awesome to see. Uh, the thing that, that makes him so great, I mean, obviously he's just physically matured and he's stronger and all that, but, but his competitiveness, his toughness, his will to win, his ball skills – are second to none. Did you see that? At absolutely, Clemson? absolutely. That you saw that in DeAndre Hopkins all the way from. You know, I watched him from the rec leagues all the way up through middle school and high school because he's from Clemson, right there in the uh, you know central uh, area. So uh, he's been doing legendary things like that since he was in the uh, in the Pee Wee leagues there uh, around Clemson. All right, how about this one? We'll go back to Watson, or at least his teammate Vic Beasley. Uh, Vic Beasley, uh, explosive, fast. You know, obviously in his second year he led the NFL in sacks. You don't luck up and do that. Uh, so same thing. I think the biggest thing with him is, you know, getting him in the right spot and really just letting him do what he do, does best, and that's rush the passer. Uh, he, he's so much better at playing the run than he gets credit for. But this guy can flat get after uh, the quarterback, and uh, I think he's he's same thing. As long as he wants to play and he can stay healthy, he's going to be impactful because his his get off, uh, his strength. People don't realize how strong he is, uh, and his relentlessness uh, really separates him. He's a very very unique player uh, at that position in the NFL. Well, obviously we we picked the headliners. We didn't have to reach too far for those guys. Any other player, former player that's playing in the league right now that has you pretty. Pretty proud. Yeah, well, you know, we've got 40-something guys in the NFL, and, and, you know, I'm proud of all those free agents. You know, I'm, I'm proud of, you know, when, when you mentioned Vic right there, uh, I remember talking to Dan Quinn, and, uh, you know, Vic, I was like, you, you're going to really like Vic. I mean, he's a freak talent, but you're going to love Grady Jarrett. You know, if I could start my f- whole football program over again, and you said, hey, you get three guys to pick, Grady Jarrett would be in that three. This guy is – um, he he's he is the heart. He 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 really is, and and that's what's happened with the Falcons, you know. And and when he his second year, I guess when they played in the Super Bowl uh, or third year, whenever that was, he hit three sacks against Tom Brady. I mean, this guy is a relentless competitor. He's one of those guys that probably wasn't big enough, wasn't long enough, wasn't this, wasn't that. But yet he's. Uh, uh, I think this year he was maybe an alternate for the Pro Bowl. And then I love a guy like Adam Humphreys. Adam Humphreys didn't get invited to the combine. Uh, or anything, and uh, he gets a tryout with the Bucks, and all he's done is start for three years for the Bucks, and and uh, so I love stories like that. I love seeing guys uh, take take the stuff that they got with them at our program and go be successful at the next level in football, but also out in life as well. What about the next level for you, Coach? Any interest in coaching in the NFL? Uh, you know, I, I really, to be honest with you, I've never really thought much about it. Uh, I mean, nobody's really ever called me and said, hey, you want to come coach this NFL then team? Then you think about it, I guess. Uh, but, but, you know, I've never really put much thought into it. I've always just been so focused on what I'm doing. I mean, I guess you never say never. Uh, but I love what I do. I love uh, – I like recruiting. I like teaching. I like mentoring. You know, I like the challenge of college football. But, 
uh, who knows? You know, I still got a long time to go, hopefully, and a lot of football in front of me, but uh, we'll see. You got a lot of football in front of you, and it starts next week when camp opens. Yeah, it does. If I know anything about Clemson, it will not be chilly. It will, it will not be cool. It will hey, be hot. Hey, as we say, mo hotter, mo better. Well, you go- uh, can't wait to get started. <laughs> I suspect you'll be in pretty good shape. Coach, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your you got insight. It. Trick shot? I don't know. Maybe if you're Tom Brady. How about this from Instagram? A video of Brady in shoulder pads and the helmet going deep to the guys in the golf cart. Why not? When you're Tom Brady, it works. Here's Mike Reese with a look at the Patriots soft season. There's a situation in New England. Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski not in Foxborough this week. The only one of the starting quarterbacks in the league, not with his team, as OTAs get underway. When it comes to three of the most important people in the Patriots organization, Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, and Bill Belichick, one word sums up the offseason they're about to leave behind. Different. It is rocky between them, and he's not hiding it publicly, which is jarring. Do you feel appreciated by them? I plead the fifth. Brady's communication with the Patriots wasn't at the same level as it's been in the past. That was reflected in him skipping all voluntary workouts for what is believed to be the first time in his 19-year career. Tom, I think he's just deciding like a lot of veterans that I know how to get my body right myself. A decision he's maintained was based primarily on family considerations, but others have speculated might also be tied to Belichick setting new boundaries with his trainer and close friend, Alex Guerrero. He believes his best to take care of himself is to work with Alex Guerrero. I'm focused on the guys that are here. Those are the guys that uh, working with in this OTA's process. Gronkowski took a similar approach, both in terms of limiting communication with the team and by staying away from workouts, saying it was what he felt was best for his body. It wasn't until April 24th, two days after a playful Supercross news conference. There has been a lot of speculation around my whereabouts this offseason. That didn't reflect well on his standing as a team captain, that he met with Belichick to commit to another season. Not having two of his most important players on hand for voluntary workouts made it a different offseason for Belichick, whose costly decision to bench Malcolm Butler in Super Bowl 52 lingered into the spring for some players. Belichick lightened things up by having Lakers great Kobe Bryant visit in late May, then taking a team field trip to Fenway Park. The Patriots' two biggest stars showed up the mini camp today. Both Tom Brady and his tight end, Rob Gronkowski, were on the field. Now, as they were for three days in early June at mandatory minicamp, Brady, Gronkowski, and Belichick are back together again. Everything's good. It just felt really good to be back out on the field. That's what matters most. I love this team. I love this organization. And, you know, I love playing quarterback for them. Aligned in pursuit of a singular goal, another Super Bowl championship. But how they got to this point was markedly different from past years. What a perfect segue to Overreaction Monday as we continue. Here's our statement. The Patriots' off-season drama, and there was some, will affect the regular season. Tim, overreaction or no overreaction? It's overreaction, mainly because we've seen them overcome every distraction that they've ever faced in the past under Belichick with Brady as their quarterback. I mean, I understand it, that it's legitimate. It's been documented at the same time. When good players show up to play during the season, they play for Belichick, they usually have a lot of success. Fair enough. Lewis? Yeah, I'm going to say it's an overreaction overall. We're talking about will it have effects on the regular season. I think early in the season you could see some hiccup, like in the first quarter of the season, because there's a bunch of new players. Mm -hmm. But look, this team is conditioned to hit its stride in November and December, and that's when the Patriot way really shows itself, and it rears its ugly head as it relates to other people looking at them, and that's when they start hitting their stride. This program is tried and true and tested, and the three guys that we're talking about are really the guys, along with so many other great New England Patriots, though, but they're the guys who make the Patriot way what it is, and that's Bill and Tom, and Gronk will go down as one of the greatest Patriots of all time. I think when, it, when, it, when the rubber meets the road, as Mike Tomlin likes to say, in November, they'll be there. I'm with you, too, they'll as be well. I, 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 I disagree. Think, I think this would be an overreaction, but the, the person I'm going to point out on why I think that this would be an overreaction 
is actually Josh McDaniels. I think the fact that they, they were able to keep him as the offensive coordinator there sort of keeps them all together, specifically on offense. He does have a great relationship with Tom Brady. Tom Brady obviously wants Gronk out there. Everyone is on the same page at this at this point. And adding to, to what these two just said, I mean, we have 17, 18, 19 years of data to prove that the New England Patriots have been able to overcome any any issues, whether it's injuries, suspensions, which, you know, we know they're dealing with Edelman and we're missing the first four games of the season, but I don't think any of that's going to be a problem. Yeah, until proven otherwise. Mm-hmm. That's all I would say, until proven otherwise. Uh, some tragic news from the weekend with the NFL family. Minnesota Vikings offensive line coach Tony Sperano died unexpectedly. He was 56, and the team made that announcement Sunday afternoon. An assistant with Minnesota for the past two seasons, Sperano worked for nine NFL teams over 19 years. Vikings head coach Mike Zimmer, just one of many who reached out with thoughts on the coach. I love Tony Sperano. He was a great teacher, a grinder of a worker, and had a toughness and fighting spirit that showed in our linemen. He was a great husband, father, and grandfather, and a great friend to me. This is just sinking in for us, but Tony will be sorely missed by all. Lewis, I know... Like so many, you crossed paths with Coach Sperano, I believe, in D.C. Yeah, yeah, I sure did. I didn't know him personally very well, but look, I think one of the greatest ways that, you know, you can find out about the respect that others have about you is when, you know, you have guys like this, like great players that he has coached who come out and just revere and just kind of talk glowingly about the effect that he had on their lives personally and on their lives as professional athletes. And that's what I believe, Wendy, all teachers would want, is want to know that they made a positive impact on you. I think that's one of the greatest, really, signs that you were a good leader or a great leader. And it seems like he has done that without a doubt. He is someone in the football world was considered to be a tremendous worker, a guy who really dug into his craft and took it very serious. It's awful. It's heartbreaking to hear about how he was taken away from his family and how now they are left to kind of pick up the pieces and carry on without him. But look, in the football world, which is what we're talking about right now, he is widely, widely respected. Widely respected. And I think, you know, Lewis, you kind of touched on it with the idea of, you know, a lot of times guys get into coaching to have an impact on people's lives. It's hard to do that in the pros because by the Mm -hmm. time you get those players, they've kind of been told they've been great or whatever it may be, and they're not necessarily looking for, you know, that type of influence in their life. And so... If you can do that, which clearly Tony Sperano was able to do, then that really probably is a definition of a good coach when you can do it at that level. And so to see things that you know, Jake Long and, and guys that have kind of tweeted about in terms of or made comments about you know, his influence on their life, um, it, 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 it's, it's, that's tough. It's tough for someone who has played for him or was, was going to continue to play for him. And it's also you know, obviously devastating for his family. The three words that you see over and over on those tweets that we just showed you was, you believed in me. And the power of having a head coach, whether he was the head coach then or assistant, believing the players and them appreciating that tells you the kind of man he is. And also a lot of comments on what a tremendous father he was, which is, I'm sure, the the proudest memory that, that his family will have of him. I am the face of NFL history. Many have walked my hallowed grounds. And a hell of a journey ain't ended today! Through the brisk Wisconsin fall, into the bitterest cold of winter, masses of green and gold pile in to witness legends, greatness, history. We're only here because we win, period. I am Lambo. That is Lambeau, and NFL Live is on the road and making a visit celebrating the Packers' 100-year anniversary with team legends inside live practice. Our Packers panel taking you behind the scenes of Lambeau Secrets, hosted by Wisconsin native John Anderson, Desmond Howard, and Matt Hasselbeck. Packers legends all around. Speaking of Super Bowl winning quarterbacks, Aaron Rodgers took part in Shark Week, but that's not Aaron Rodgers, that's Drew Brees, and he's getting ready for camp. Uh, obviously, his quarterback, his contract situation settled for the foreseeable future. So the Saints will report. That's a hard exercise to do in right just there. a few days. It, that's hard. It looks hard. That takes tremendous course. There's Aaron Rodgers, and there's those sharks again, Lewis Riddick. Yeah, where you wanted to push me in? Yeah, no, I didn't say that. Yes, Part of the Discovery yeah, Channel yeah. Shark Week again. We will revisit why sharks are so good at what they do, which is. I don't know, eating people, I guess. Massive size. They can grow to an average 20 feet in length. 
They've got unreal eyesight. They can see colors and detect light even in darkness. Impressive bursts of speed. They're fast, mm -hmm. Lewis, 25 mm -hmm. to 30 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And don't even talk about the great bite force, 20 times greater than the bite force of a human. We did this with the AFC. We'll do it in the NFC. The top three defensive sharks in the NFC and explain what we yeah. mean by that again. Well, I'll tell you what. Look, we're going to start with Keanu Neal. Now, we're not going to have any video. This is a safety for the Atlanta Falcons. But when you're talking about Shark Week, Shark Week and you're talking about tremendous bursts of speed, great bite force, great vision. Okay, we do have some video. See? This kid on the football field has those kinds of things. Tremendous speed and bite force. That's bite force right there as far as his striking ability, his instincts, his ability to work his way through traffic, his ability to diagnose plays. It's just tremendous. He's one of the most explosive players in the NFL. Now, this guy, everyone's heard of Earl Thomas. Now, he doesn't have tremendous size that was, was on this screen, but I will tell you this. He's got every other attribute. Here's tremendous vision as far as diagnosing plays. And pound for pound, he's one of the most explosive players at the point of attack in the NFL, and he's done it a long time. And the next guy that we're going to show on the screen, you know he's near and dear to my heart. Oh, you boy. know, this is Number the ultimate one. hunter. This is the hammerhead, great white. He's all of those wrapped the up in the one. White. You know, this is this guy. <laughs> Look, Aaron Donald is just, he's just got the entire package. Now, you would say, well, he doesn't have tremendous size like a guy like Fletcher Cox, who I also thought about putting on this list. But Aaron has it all. He has instincts, he has speed, he has strength. And when you need him the most, and he needs to go out hunting the most, he's the guy who's going to get it done. You know, I, you know, I kind of like these, these analogies right here because. These guys, look, every every football team has players that they say this. When you need it the most, this is the one guy who you know is going to hunt them down and find the people that you need to find and put them on the ground. I think I picked six pretty good ones, Wendy. I, I, I say so. I like these guys. I don't like Shark Week, but I like those yeah, guys. Yeah, so, I agree. Fair enough. I agree. I, I don't want to see these guys. No. ESPN Fantasy Football is back. Be a commissioner. Create your own league. You can do it now at ESPN.com. The Hamilton Tiger Cats have traded quarterback Johnny Manziel. He's headed to the Montreal Alouettes. It does reunite him with the coach who recruited him to play at Texas A&M. He'll play for first-year coach Mike Sherman, who was formerly the head coach of the Aggies and perhaps an opportunity to play because for the Tiger Cats, uh, he really hasn't seen any time at all, yeah, I don't you, believe. Not so I think it's a great opportunity for him, you know, up there it, once he gets on the field. I think that, that style of play suits his game. That's uh, the next step. Lewis Riddick, Tim Hasselbeck, Diana Rossini. I'm Wendy Nix. Hope you'll join us tomorrow. Camp is in session. Right now, though, the jump is next. Nick Saban joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm. Allie's mom knew she had a strong kick even back in the womb. And from then on, Allie was always kicking a ball and saying she was going to play pro soccer. And one day, while she was kicking a ball against a wall, her skills drew even more attention. Her boss said, Could you please stop that and get me those quarterly numbers I asked for? Turns out Allie just wasn't that good a talker. But she was a good accountant. That's why she switched to GEICO. She knew they could save her a bunch of money on car insurance. And she sure wasn't ever going to make that pro soccer money. No, sir.